Hi, I'm Doug Besharoff, and I'm delighted to welcome you here to this, I think, the first debate. Is that right? Yes. Uh, we're delighted. And I think there will be one more on another University of Maryland campus, so we are delighted. Uh, my job right now is to say I am really delighted that the president of our university, Dr. Wallace Lowe, is here, and he'd like to say a few welcoming words to the audience and to the three candidates. And a microphone is going to him right this minute. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Besharoff, and uh, welcome everybody to the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. We are pleased to host this debate tonight between the three candidates for Attorney General, the Chief Legal Officer of the State of Maryland. And I'm very pleased also to say that this debate is sponsored by the Brody Family Foundation. The Norman and Florence Brody family has been a proud sponsor of public policy forums, and I'm pleased to acknowledge the presence of uh, Bill. I will say very briefly that you will recall that Hubert Humphrey once said that democracy is hammered. It's hammered out on the anvil of debate. Debate is the purest, oldest form of democratic discourse going all the way back to the time of the Athenians. And it is by this debate, in person, up close, on stage, live, that we get to see the positions of the candidates, that we get to gauge something about them as, as individuals, and an informed electorate is always a better electorate. So thank you all for coming, and thank you for the candidates for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Lowe, and thank you for being here with us. Uh, as I said, I'm Doug Besharoff, and I moderate tonight, which means that I just have to keep us on time, and I have to follow the rules. Let me first introduce the candidates, although I'm sure you know them all. Um, earlier this evening, they uh, drew straws for their order at the uh, podium, and also their order in opening questions and follow-up, uh, opening statements and follow-up questions. To uh, your immediate uh, far left is Brian Frosch, who has served for 28 years in the Maryland House of Delegates and then the State Senate, representing Montgomery County. In the middle uh, podium is John Carden, who has served for 12 years in the Maryland House of Delegates, representing Maryland's District 11 in Baltimore. And uh, Aisha Brave, Brave Boy has served for eight years in the Maryland House of Delegates, representing District 25 in Prince George's County. Uh, we have an arrangement that's a little bit like we hope the presidential debate, which is we have three fabulous uh, journalists to ask questions. Uh, to my immediate right is Erin Cox, who covers Maryland politics for the Baltimore Sun, and they'll be asking questions in that order so that I don't mess up. Uh, Jenna Johnson covers Maryland politics for the Washington Post, and Tracy Wilkins uh, is the uh, bureau chief for Prince George's County for News Channel 4. The candidates agreed on six general topic areas. The journalists divided the topic areas two to each journalist. I know which topic areas they're going to ask. I have not seen the final questions and I don't think anyone except the journalists have. So uh, that's the way it was supposed to be, and I think that's going to be what it is. Each candidate gets asked the question once, and each and the subsequent candidates answer the same question. I'll spend a minute saying, um, uh, Mr. Frosch, you take the first question, then after Mr. Frosch is done, I will say Mr. Cardin, and then just to keep us going. Six questions, three in that direction, three in the other direction, just so that the same person isn't always following the person before. Um, oh, you can clap a little. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean now, not to me. I mean, if your candidate says something that you like. I have more to say, so you can hold your applause in a, for me. Uh, the openings are two minutes, 
we're going to police this because we're going to try roughly to be 60 minutes, maybe 65 minutes. The closings are 90 seconds. The questions are 90 seconds. And here's the tricky part, which is what I have to do. If one of the candidates mentions directly or indirectly one of the other candidates, the other candidate can give a signal to me saying he or she wants a rebuttal. All they have to do is something like this or whatever. Or <laughs> and after that speaker so is done, who did I? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we lost one journalist here. After, after that speaker is done, then I'll call for the rebuttal. Also, the journalists are allowed uh, to ask follow-up questions as well. Uh, and that's in their discretion. Sort of towards the end of the evening, if things get late, uh, I may say, let's keep the answers short. Let's keep the questions uh, short. Before we begin, uh, I thought it would be useful if I read the description of the Attorney General's duties, just so we get that. The Attorney General is the chief legal officer of the state. The Attorney General's office has general charge, supervision, and direction of the legal business of the state, acting as legal advisor and representative of the major departments, various boards, that's quite a list, commissions, officials, and institutions of the state government. That's, I think, everybody. Uh, the, the office further represents the state in all cases on appeal, appellate courts of the state, and the US Supreme Court. The attorney general is elected by vote every four years, is not time, term limited, and must be a citizen of the state of Maryland, and have practiced law for 10 years. And if you haven't done that, please leave now. <laughs> all right, as I said by the uh, drawing of the straws, the opening statements will be the order, in the order of Mr. Frosch, Mr. Cardin, Ms. Brave Boy, and Mr. Frosch, the podium is yours. Thank you very much. As one of my colleagues famously said on the Senate floor before I speak, I'd like to say a few words. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, I want to thank Professor Besharov and the University of Maryland for hosting us and thank our journalists, Aaron Cox, Janet Johnson, and Tracy Wilkins for taking time out of their busy schedules to put us through the ringer. Uh, I want to thank uh, Delegates Cardin and Brave Boy uh, for joining me to talk about the importance of the Office of the Attorney General. I've traveled all over the state and I hear the same themes wherever I go. People want to feel safe in their neighborhoods. They want clean air to breathe. They want clean water to drink. And they want equal opportunity. They want a fair shot at the American dream. And they want a quality education for their kids. And these are things that I have spent my career fighting for. Uh, I can tell you that as your attorney general, I will show up every day and I will work hard to protect Maryland families and to improve their lives. Throughout my career, I have been a leader in the fight to make Maryland families safer. I led the fight to enact the nation's toughest gun safety law. I increased protections this past year for victims of domestic violence. I expanded court jurisdiction over dangerous sex offenders. Uh, I championed laws to prevent and to prosecute child abuse, and I led the fight to help prosecutors bring to justice people who commit violent crimes with handguns. As Attorney General, I will continue to fight to make Maryland safe. I will stand up for consumers and vulnerable adults. I will crack down on identity theft, frauds, and scams against consumers, uh, and I will be a strong advocate for people who feel their voices aren't heard. In short, I'll be the people's lawyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Frost. Frost. Mr. Cardin. Thank you very much, President Lowe. Mr. Brody, thank you for, uh, for your time at University of Maryland here. It's a pleasure to be here. We live in a rapidly changing world. I'm running for attorney general to keep Marylanders two steps ahead of those new threats facing our families. 30 years ago, when you thought about public safety, it was about crime in the streets. When you thought about consumer protection, it was about making sure you bought a safe new car. When you thought about environmental protection, it was about, it was about getting trash out of the oceans. When you thought about civil rights, the road to equality seemed long and nearly impossible to navigate. And those issues are still with us today. Crime in the streets, trash in our bay, 
con artists and bigots are still out there. But the world has changed. With the internet and other new technologies that exacerbate old problems, they give criminals new methods of exploiting you. So reduction of violent crime is still our number one priority. We also have to think about internet hacking and online privacy and other cyber crimes. We also have to think about those old issues of consumer protection like owner's utility bills or lead-laced toys. But now they're coupled with websites trying to steal your credit card numbers or fish for personal information. And uh, in today's struggle for civil rights, we not only have to fight against racial profiling, but also against domestic violence and against voter ID schemes taking away minorities' rights to vote. And uh, in environmental protection, we do have to clean up the bay. We also have to think about carbon emissions and their impact on climate change. As one of the most progressive and pragmatic legislators, as the only general practice attorney, and as, a, as, an unapologetic, as an unapologetic supporter of democratic principles, I'm uniquely qualified to tackle these next generation issues without losing focus on those old and persistent problems. I'm excited about this race. I'm excited about defending your needs, your rights, and making sure that Maryland is a safe place. I'm looking forward to a spirited debate, and I look forward to your support. Thank you. Mr. Corden, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Braveboy, please. Thank you, and good evening to everyone. I want to thank the Brody Foundation and, of course, President Lowe and all of you for attending this very important debate this evening. It's always a pleasure to be at my alma mater, the University of Maryland at College Park. Um, after I graduated from this fine institution, I attended Howard University School of Law and have been a practicing attorney for uh, 14 years, nearly 14 years. Um, in addition to my private practice, I also represent clients on a pro bono basis who are facing the most critical issue to face Maryland today, which is the issue of foreclosures, which has devastated our communities. In addition to that, I serve as pro bono counsel to a large diversionary program for our juveniles. And we, as of, on, as of Friday, diverted over 3,000 young people out of the criminal justice system and on a path to success. We must reduce mass incarceration in the state of Maryland, and we must start with our young people. I want to be your attorney general because I want to deliver justice to the people of Maryland. I want to ensure that every child, whether regardless of race, socioeconomic status, um, or disability, has access to a fair and effective public education. I chair the Consumer Protection Committee for, for the House of Delegates, and I've led on many progressive um, uh, bills that protects cons protect consumers, but I know that there are scam artists out there that are targeting our seniors, they're targeting our veterans, they're targeting individuals with disabilities. And I am uniquely qualified with my experience to represent all of those individuals and all of you against corporations who want to take advantage of the people of Maryland. And I thank you so much for this opportunity and look forward to the questions. Thank you very much. And now we turn to our panel of journalists for the questions. The first question will be to Mr. Frosch, and it will be from Erin Cox. Aaron? Hi. First, thank you all very much for being here. I know it's nerve-wracking to be on this end of the microphone. I'm sure it's a lot worse over there. <laughs> um, our, my first question, and it, I will ask of each of you, all of you have said that as Attorney General, you will uh, defend and enforce Maryland's laws in all but the rarest of circumstances which is the primary role of the Attorney General. The office also has a powerful discretionary role to influence public policy. To what extent would you use that role and on which issues? Well, uh, first let me say that uh, the option of refusing to defend a law or a lawsuit against the state is one that should be exercised only in the rarest of circumstances. When Steve Sachs was Attorney General of Maryland, he was faced with lawsuits uh, against the Department of, I think what was then the Health, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, adults who had developmental disabilities and mental illnesses were warehoused in prison-like conditions. And General Sachs said, I'm not going to defend that lawsuit, those lawsuits. 
that's an appropriate use of the Attorney General's discretion. I will advocate on behalf of Marylanders on a variety of issues. I have the 28 years of experience in the General Assembly on issues of public safety, environmental protection, consumer protection. I've gotten important protections and legislation passed for Marylanders in all of those categories. So I will go back to the General Assembly on issues of importance. When you see credit card debt causing the same problems that we experienced in the subprime crisis, when you see uh, issues with our health care system, with our health care exchanges, I will go back to the General Assembly and I will advocate uh, for solutions. I will protect the civil rights of Marylanders. I will advocate for environmental protection. And I will fight to make Maryland safe for all of its citizens. Thank you very much. Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, and it's a good question because the fact of the matter is, is that the Attorney General has to look at uh, the legislative wing as an opportunity to actually improve the quality of life of every single Marylander. I'll give you two examples of where I would focus on uh, the legislative office as a, a, as a bully pulpit or for, to create legislative initiatives. The first is environmental protection. We need to make sure that we are creating laws that protect every single citizen in the state of Maryland. Um, their air, their water, their bay. And if we are not doing that effectively, and if the regulations are not effective in actually improving the quality of the bay, then we need to, as the Attorney General's Office, work with the legislature to make sure we provide the laws that actually protect each one of us. Also, in consumer protection, just generally, I'll give you a statistic. 2012 Bureau of Justice Statistics reported that 16.6 .6 million Americans have experienced identity theft, costing us nearly $25 billion. There's opportunities for the Attorney General to be advocating for online and personal identity theft legislation, for college diploma mill legislation, and for predatory check cashing legislation that's gonna make sure that we actually rectify the situation and bring Marylanders a safe and effective environment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boy. Thank you, thank you so much for that question. I can give you a specific example of where I would not defend the state's position on an issue and that's with our historically black colleges and universities. The state was sued back in 2006 because a coalition representing our four historically black colleges and universities uh, asserted that the state was denying them equal protection under the U.S. Constitution. And last year, uh, in October of 2013, the federal court found that Maryland that this state, this progressive state of Maryland, violated the Constitution, not only the Constitution, but the Civil Rights Act of 1964 um, by running what's called a dual system of higher education, which flew in the face of the Brown versus Board of Education decision, which said that separate but equal is inherently unequal. And if you think about this year, we're 50 years out of the um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, we're 50, uh, 50 years out of the Civil Rights Act, 60 years out of Brown, and the state of Maryland continues to be defiant and arrogant when it comes to higher education and ensuring that all of our campuses are treated equally. We cannot continue to defend the state's position that they're doing enough because they just simply aren't. Yeah. Thank you very much. Our, our next question comes from uh, Ms. Johnson from the Washington Post, and the first candidate to answer will be Mr. Cardin. Great. All right, let's talk about your qualifications for the job. Um, and each of you have criticisms of your qualifications that are floating out there. Um, Delegate Cardin, back in 2009, your judgment was called into question. Um, when you used a Baltimore, Baltimore helicopter and police officers um, to stage a fake raid and a marriage proposal. Uh, more recently, uh, you missed nearly 75% of your committee votes during the legislative session up in Annapolis. Uh, Delegate Brave Boy, uh, as we got started, um, we heard the years that everyone has been serving in Annapolis. Um, Senator Frosch has been there for 28 years, Delegate Cardin for 12, uh, and you've been there for eight years. 
which has led some crit critics to wonder if you're ready for the job or not. Um, and Senator Frosch, in Annapolis, you've built a reputation of being um, a low-key consensus builder who can quietly bring everyone together on an issue. Uh, but quite frankly, sometimes the role of attorney general requires an aggressive, bold leader. And some people have wondered if your style will match with that. Um, so my question to each of you, st starting with Delegate Cardin, is how do you respond to criticisms of your qualifications? Thank you very much for the question, and it's a fair question. And um, let me start by saying that, the, that I have tremendous respect for both my opponents, and they're, uh, they're both good people, and they're, and they're uh, very good legislators. But the role of the AG is different than that of a legislator. The AG is tasked with enforcing the laws and making sure that all Marylanders are protected. I believe that you have to do this with passion, with conviction, and with vision. This is where I differ and where I believe that I stand out. Um, I understand that the, the unique issues that Maryland families are facing. I also understand the unique, unique issues that they're going to face in the future. I've been a leader on cybercrime, on reducing cybercrime, issues like revenge porn and cyberbullying. Um, I have also uh, made it a priority of my campaign to understand both the perils and the promise of technology. Uh, and um, I think that you have to also understand the limits of technology. Um, now, uh, I have made it, um, let me say that character is not just about uh, making mistakes, because we all make mistakes. It's about how you react to those mistakes. And regarding the marriage proposal, I, in fact, apologized. I apologized to the police department. I made a, uh, a, um, um, a contribution to the police foundation. I said I was sorry. I moved on and, pr and promised to be a better legislator. And I think that I have done that. And on the issue of missing committee votes during the legislative session? Mr. The follow-ups follow allowed. Thank you very much. Um, uh, one follow just since this is the first one, one minute follow-ups. Sure, thank you very much. Um, with respect to the, the, the um, missed votes, um, you know how Annapolis works, and it's disingenuous, intellectually dishonest, to suggest that I didn't do the job or that I missed 75% of the work. The fact of the matter is, is that I have a better than 90% uh, voting uh, attendance record in my 12-year history in Annapolis. Um, and um, for those of you who don't understand the, how the good old boys of Annapolis work, the fact is that the work is done in subcommittee. And um, that's where you do the markups, where you do the amendments, and where you make sure that uh, the debates are done. And I did not miss even one subcommittee meeting. Like every working parent, I strive to balance my responsibilities as a father, and a, as a husband, and as a legislator. And I am convinced and, com and committed to doing 100% of the work and then going home to my family to handle our health concerns in the evenings. Thank you very much, Ms. Brayboy. Thank you. I think your question to me was about my eight years versus the other candidates. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I am running not to be the top legislator, but to be the top attorney in this county. So while I have a legislative record and um, time in the legislature, just like my colleagues, I'm also a practicing attorney. And if you look at my record as an attorney, I have spent my time working on issues that impact Marylanders and come up, coming up with real solutions. I am the only candidate that answered the call of former Chief Judge Bell to uh, have, to, when he called for all of the attorneys in the state of Maryland to be trained to represent families facing foreclosure. I answered that call, I represented families, helped to train other attorneys, and um, held numerous workshops to help keep Maryland families in their homes. In addition to that, again, I mentioned to you that I'm a counsel for a juvenile diversionary program. This uh, juvenile, uh, juvenile delinquency and, and the overcrowding of our jails is a major issue, one that the next attorney general must be able to deal with. I have dealt with that issue. In addition to that, I think what, instead of me being entrenched in Annapolis, I'm an independent um, a, a legislator, and I'm not afraid to speak my mind, to stand up for the rights of people, 
and, and to disagree with my party or with my colleagues when necessary to represent your interests. And that's what you need in an attorney general. Thank you very much. Mr. Price. I think Thank the question was that um, you're too nice. <laughs> it was more complicated. I'll try to than cut that, that out. Um, look, I, I've been practicing law for more than 35 years. I've been named one of the best lawyers in America by U.S. News and World Report, super lawyers in Maryland, best lawyers in the Washington metropolitan area. You don't get there just by being a nice guy. Sometimes you've got to be tough. And believe me, uh, I'm tough in the courthouse, tough in the state house when I, need, when, when I need to be. I set a good example for my colleagues. I come to work every day. I work hard. I, I have to say that John missing 75% of the votes in the Ways and Means Committee is not something to just brush off. There's no excuse for it. Uh, can you imagine a firefighter saying, you know, I know those 75 houses burned down, uh, but I wanted to spend more time with my family. Uh, I, I, uh, and I made it to a lot of other fires. Look, um, the, if you don't show up in Annapolis, if you don't vote, you don't count. And you don't deserve a promotion when you're not doing the job that you were elected to do. As Attorney General, I'll work hard. I'll set a good example. It's not a no-show job. I'll be there to fight for the people of Maryland. Mr. Mr. Cardin asked for a rebuttal. One minute, Mr. Cardin. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, look, look uh, as I said, I have a 90% uh, attendance record in my 12 years, and we had approximately 2,750 votes that I took this year alone in Annapolis. Um, I did miss some committee votes. We're talking about 120 votes out of 2,750. Let's talk about those votes. Not, there was not a single bill that was affected by my absence. I checked with my chair every single day that I had to miss to make sure that every vote was going to go the way that it needed to. And if she needed me, I would have been there. I did everything that I needed to do in subcommittee to make sure that my job was done in Annapolis. And then like every other working parent, as I said, and this is a very, very important distinction, we have to, we have to balance our roles as a family person, as a parent, and as a husband and as a legislator. I am confident that I did 100% of the work and that I went home to handle the medical needs which were supposed to remain private with my family. And I made sure that my chairman checked it out and every single vote was excused. Uh, since this has turned into a discussion of committee votes, uh, Delegate Brave Boy, can you tell us a little bit about um, your voting record uh, on your committee and um, the, if you think what the importance of those votes are. I, I believe I have a, an excellent voting record on my committee. Um, it's, I, I it serve as uh, a chair of one of our subcommittees. And so our chairman relies on his subcommittee chairs, like myself and others, to help uh, uh, to direct, uh, not only uh, look at the legislation, but also uh, make recommendations for amendments to legislation coming before our committee during our voting sessions. And so we are required, every committee is different, but we are really required and looked upon as leaders on our committee. So I attend my voting sessions. If I'm ill, which maybe I was once or twice during the year, or if I'm voting on, or excuse me, testifying on a bill in the Senate, um, my chairman knows. Um, but again, as a leader on my committee, I'm expected to be there and I show up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our third question comes from uh, Tracy Wilkins, and the first uh, response comes from Delegate Braveboy. This question will be on something that Delegate Braveboy has just mentioned, civil rights. A federal district judge ruled in October that Maryland's higher educational policies violate the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause by not allowing historically black colleges and universities to offer unique high-demand programs. HBCU supporters believe this has been done to protect the enrollment at institutions like the University of Maryland, fine institution. U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder just yesterday pointed out this inequity while delivering a speech at Morgan State University. 
The court found that Maryland's traditionally white universities have an average of 42 unique programs, while historically black institutions average around 10 per school. An equal playing ground has been a constant fight for historically black colleges in Maryland. What, if any, would your opinion be on this ongoing issue? Well, we clearly need to settle this issue. Um, since 1936, the state has commissioned studies on the state's, the higher education system in our state. And each study that the state has commissioned has results, resulted in a finding that the historically black colleges and universities have been underfunded, that, it, that, it, that they are not on par with the traditionally white institutions in our state. That is, that, that's from Maryland's own commissioned documents. And so what Maryland decided to do was defend itself against a lawsuit that says that practice is wrong. You know, in higher education, as in um, uh, K through 12 education, we have a responsibility as a state to integrate our educational systems. And when we duplicate programs, what happens is that students, that, that diverse student body doesn't come to those institutions. And I'll give you an example. Morgan State University had a thriving MBA program. The Maryland Higher Education Commission allowed uh, Towson State University and the University of Baltimore to create a, a dual uh, a program, an MBA program that directly competed with Morgan State's program. And it directly affected Morgan State's enrollment and its diversity. We cannot continue to run a dual system of higher education in our state. It's wrong, it's unconstitutional, it violates the Civil Rights Act, and as a progressive state, Maryland must and should take the lead. And as Attorney General, I will counsel the next governor to do so. Well, the moderator is allowed to ask follow-up questions, so I'd like to ask a follow-up yes. question. Uh, the first round of uh, questions included the issue of whether the Attorney General would decide not to defend a lawsuit against the state. If a lawsuit, if another lawsuit was brought, would you defend that? Well, we're still in litigation because right now the the judge found uh, against the state of Maryland on the issue of duplication of programs, and the court ordered the parties to mediate a remedy for that finding of of, of Maryland being unconstitutional, and so we're still in the process of dealing with that current litigation. And unfortunately, the state of Maryland appears to be taking the position that it does not want to fully engage in the mediation process and come up with a fair solution. Um, and so that's pretty, it's, it's unconscionable that this state, that Maryland, would take that position, but it has. And so I would counsel the next governor to resolve the issues of this current litigation so that we don't continue to find ourselves in violation of the U.S. Constitution and in violation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Thank you. Mr. Farage. Thank you. Uh, so I have a long record of supporting HBCUs. They have played and will continue to play a vital role in our system of higher education. Uh, they need and deserve ample funding. The next attorney general is going to have to be somebody who is tuned into and sensitive to diversity, to civil rights, and to justice. I've been endorsed by Equality Maryland, by Maryland Now, by CASA in action, because I've led the Senate on measures to stop racial profiling, to protect minorities from hate crimes. Uh, I've written laws that protect folks from predatory lending practices and predatory foreclosure practices. Uh, I fought to prevent discrimination based on source of income. And I was proud to support the Maryland Dream Act, which gives students who've grown up in our state the right to go to the University of Maryland at in-state tuition rates, uh, a bill that uh, John opposed. The situation with respect to the HBCUs is one in which the Attorney General represents the institutions that are in conflict with each other. Uh, Judge Blake ordered the parties to mediate. And as Jenna suggested a moment ago, I excel at bringing people together, at finding common ground. <laughs> and that's precisely what I would do as Attorney General. Mr. Pardon. Mr. Pardon. Will I be able to respond to the comments about the DREAM Act or 
No, that was not a. He, he no, I think that was just a fact. That was just fair, a fact. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I think the question I was actually about HBCUs and and what we're going to be dealing doing with them. Let me just say first of all that our present attorney general actually originally got got it right, and um, the state didn't take his advice, and that's why we're in this this issue. But uh, to be honest, the, one of the great shames of the state of Maryland is that for 15 years after the Brown versus Board of Education decision, it's the 60th anniversary was just this past week, 15 years after, we still had segregated education. But what came out of that was a wonderful system of HBCUs. We have four fantastic uh, institutions, Bowie, Coppin, UMES, and Morgan. I know how good these have been, not only to the state, but to all the students that have gone there. My grandmother worked at Morgan State for more than 20 years. She showed me what these institutions have done. Now, if I were Attorney General at the time that this began, I would have tried to work as hard as I could to negotiate a settlement before litigation ensued. What we can hope for now is that we can work together, and as an Attorney General who can bring people together, generally does things in a bipartisan way, I've always had bipartisan support on my legislation, and I am known for my ability to get people to cooperate. I will bring people together on this specific piece, on this specific litigation, to try and resolve it efficiently and effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are halfway through, so the next question will go to Aaron Cox, but we're going to flip the order. Mr. Frosch will go first, then we'll go over to Delegate um, Bradley. Okay, Aaron. This question uh, is about the environment, and there's a lot of different topics that we could focus on. I would like to talk about the fact that the Baltimore-Washington area has some of the poorest air quality in the nation. The American Lung Association recently ranked the region worst, uh, excuse me, ninth worst in the country for ground level ozone, which we better know as smog, and that makes us uh, the worst on the East Coast. Uh, some of the sturdy air drifts in from other states. Some of it is produced here. How would you use the power of your office, both as a carrot and a stick, to improve Maryland's air quality? Well, uh, first let me say that I've been endorsed by the Maryland League of Conservation Voters and the Sierra Club because they know me. They know I'll fight for clean air. I have fought for clean air. I was the sponsor of the clean cars legislation back in the 1990s and again in uh, early this century to require tighter emission standards for our automobiles, which is uh, one of the largest sources of, of pollution in our state. Uh, Out-of-state pollution that drifts in from the Midwest utilities is something of concern not only to the state of Maryland, but to every state east of those utilities. The U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency has taken on those utilities, has put on tight standards that they're going to have to meet as Attorney General of Maryland, I would join other Attorneys General in bringing together those states that are suffering from that bad air and sue the utilities if necessary, sue the, the states, uh, a suit between states uh, has original jurisdiction in the United States Supreme Court. It's something that is very rarely done, uh, but not necessarily uh, something that would be out of the question here. Uh, the utilities have to be held accountable, but I would do everything possible to make sure that the people of Maryland breathe clean air. Ms. Braithwine, your turn. Thank you very much for that question. You know, I represent a district that has a disproportionate number, number of landfills and rubble fills and other facilities um, that create um, environmental and, of course, um, issues in terms of air quality within, within those, within those ju jurisdictions. And unfortunately, in a state like Maryland, we still see a lot of disparity on where these types of facilities are located. They're typically in low-income areas and in areas of color, where, where people of color live. And this is a huge, um, huge environmental injustice that continues to go on in our state. And that's why I fought hard on alternative energy you know, this year, or last year actually, I authored um, a local bill to create a task force to study any energy generation here 
in Prince George's County. And one of the reasons why I thought this was so critically important is because, number one, we need to grow um, jobs in the area of alternative en en energy in our state in general, but we also must ensure that our next generation has the ability to have and, and to breathe you know, clean air. And so when you have alternative clean, uh, clean energy generation in your jurisdictions, then you're not relying on some of the old fossil fuels and others that create um, problems in terms of, of air quality. And so as Attorney General, I would certainly use that as a bull bully pulpit to, uh, to, to enforce and, and to recommend alternative energy in our state and also to look at uh, the environmental justice issues that go on in our state. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, yeah. we have a follow-up question, please. One moment, Mr. Carter. Delegate Brave Boy, thank you very much for describing um, what you have done and talking about the task force. And uh, you mentioned using the office as a bully pulpit. I was wondering if you could say some other specific things you would do to improve the air quality. Would you sue another state? What other sorts of things would you do as Attorney General? Oh, oh absolutely. I, and I, I, I'm sorry. Absolutely. And one of the things that we must do is grow our environmental uh, protection division within the office of the Attorney General. Um, years ago, there used to be like 12 um, individuals in that, that unit. Now, I think it's down to five, which means we don't have the proper and uh, level of investigators to go out and investigate um, corporations that are polluting our air. Uh, we don't have the appropriate level, staffing level of attorneys to actually represent the state's interest in court. And so we really have to grow that unit. It's extremely important that we do so. And we have to go after those polluters because they still exist in our state and we're still at risk. Thank you very much. Mr. Cardin. Thank Aaron. Aaron, thank you very much for the question. Over the past nine years, as already been mentioned, six, uh, budget cuts have significantly reduced the Environmental Crimes Unit of the Attorney General's Office. It's gone down from 12 down to 5. We now have three uh, attorneys and two investigators, and that's it. If elected Attorney General, first of all, I will reinstate uh, the full 12-member full um, uh, group of the, of the Environmental Crimes Unit, and I will consider actually elevating it to its own separate division because the air quality, as well as the water quality, for every single Marylander is that important. I look at the environmental protection um, uh, aspect of the job in a three, from a three-pronged approach. Prevention, uh, mediation, and litigation. First, prevention. We should use our education, our finite dollars, to make sure that companies are actually doing what they're supposed to do and following the regulations so that we can save everybody money and save all of us uh, the problems that we face through air pollution. Mediation, let's negotiate settlements if we can, as I learned in the environmental, uh, in the environmental law clinic, you can oftentimes get better results and save a lot of money by mediating solutions. And then of course, if you have bad actors out there, we're gonna go after them. We're gonna be tough, we're gonna go after them. Uh, the President Attorney General went after uh, the coal-fired power plant in the Tennessee Valley that has been polluting us for years, got us a million dollars, I will continue to seek resolutions like that because the quality of air for our children and for our families is vitally important to the, to the citizens of Maryland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Clark. And I have a follow-up question. From uh, you mentioned that the Environmental cr Crimes Unit had been reduced because of budget cuts and you would hire, I believe this number was seven additional attorneys and possibly make it its own department. How would you go about paying for that? Well, uh, first of all, there are, we, we just got a million dollars from the Tennessee Valley Coal Fire Power Plant, and that kind of money can be negotiated with the administration to see if we can actually improve our, um, our uh, um, environmental crimes unit, number one. Number two is that uh, when you do have a good working relationship and a loyal uh, uh, relationship with the administration, you can talk about how it is important, is vitally important to protect the interests in the, of the citizens of Maryland. And I think that the clean air and clean water, what we're talking about air here, is one of those issues. And it doesn't, I've been looking at all of the gubernatorial candidates from, from both parties, and they're all talking about environmental protection as important. And I think we can work on that. And finally, there is a, a, an absolute uh, ability to look at the office and the budgets for the office 
and focus on the issues that are most important to Marylanders, and certainly environmental protection is one of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take a deep breath, Mr. Cardin, because you're first up on the next question. By all means. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Johnson. Maryland has several laws that require state leaders to make decisions um, in open meetings that the public can attend uh, and to share many of the documents uh, backing up their decisions. Uh, but these laws only work when they're embraced and when they're enforced. Uh, in 2012, the University System of Maryland Board of Regents uh, met in secret to talk about moving to the Big Ten a major financial decision for the university system. Uh, more recently, Maryland launched a website where residents could sign up for health insurance made possible by the Affordable Care Act. Um, that website hasn't worked, uh, and state leaders have continued to make a lot of major decisions about the future of that website um, behind closed doors, not inviting the public in until a decision is nearly made. Uh, so my question is, as Attorney General, what would you do or not do uh, to ensure that transparency and openness is part of the culture of the state's institutions and agencies? And feel free to ignore the issue about the University of Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was going to compliment the University of Maryland in the beginning of my response, so thank you very much for that question. Um, let me just start off with, you had mentioned uh, University of Maryland. There was, a, uh, there was an attempt for a deal with the Corcoran Gallery, and I actually asked the University of Maryland for partnership. I asked the University of Maryland to help me understand that, and they were very open with making sure that the legislature um, knew what was happening in that deal. That's the kind of transparency you want. That's the kind of, kind of transparency you need in state government. Um, I have been the chairman of the election law subcommittee for the last eight years, and we have spent are in most of, our, most of our time trying to create safe, fair, open, and transparent elections because it is vitally important for every Marylander to feel as if they're being protected and they're, they're knowing what, they know what's happening in state government. I think I come by it honestly. And I would want to make sure that everywhere in state government we have that kind of transparency. Um, I voted, I, I did not support the speed camera program. Why? Because I thought that it was creating some uh, some uncertainty and non-confidence in state government because people thought this was a money grab. And I didn't, even though I want people to slow down in work sites and in school zones to protect kids and protect construction workers, it's a good philosophy. But if we don't have confidence in government through open policies of understanding what's happening out there, then we can't achieve our goals of creating confidence in government. So I would make sure, in fact, that we do have as transparent a system. Those are just a few examples of how I would do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. They'll get brave boy. Thank you very much. You know, the Attorney General's role is very unique in that it's an independently elected office, but it also is an office that serves as counsel to the agencies in government and boards and commissions. And in that role as counsel to these agencies, to the boards and commissions, the Attorney General office can counsel on how to better uh, involve and engage the public on decisions made by government. And let me give you an example of why this is so important. You know, I voted against the um, redistricting map, the congressional redistricting map, and, and there were several reasons why I voted against it, but I can tell you the one thing that really disturbed me was that the Governor's Commission on Redistricting Commission was not transparent in its process. You know, the Governor's uh, Commission went all around the state with 10-year-old maps and said to the public, hey, why don't you comment on these maps? When everyone knew that there were proposed maps that they had come up with that they did not disclose to the public. And we called upon the Governor to release those maps early so that the public had an opportunity to, comp to, um, to, to, to give the testimony on what the legislature or what this commission actually was proposing uh, to the legislature. You know, that is so important because that's where your voting rights begin. When we do that redistricting, that determines who you vote for, where you vote, whether or not your community is divided. It is so critically important. And Maryland failed on that. 
And as Attorney General, I will open up that process so that you, the citizen, have a, can be fully engaged in the redistricting process in Maryland. I have an apology to make. I should have gone to Senator Frosch next. So you get the last word on this question. Okay. Well, I have been a, a hawk on open meetings, on government transparency. I have been a practitioner of it as well. Uh, I was the, before I sponsored this law, there was no remedy if government meetings were closed, if documents weren't revealed uh, pursuant to a Public Information Act request. I sponsored legislation that gives every single person in the state of Maryland the standing to go to court and sue and get documents that they are wrongfully being refused or access to meetings that they are wrongfully being refused. Uh, I am also, as I said, a practitioner of open government. Uh, we live stream the, the hearings of the Senate Judicial Proceedings Committee until uh, I did it last year. There was no committee that had ever live streamed a voting session. I took the most controversial bill that has been dealt with in my committee or any other committee for the last 20 years, the Firearm Safety Act, and I live streamed the eight-hour voting session that we had on that legislation. Uh, it is the job of the Attorney General to get state government to obey the law. I guarantee you, when I'm Attorney General, meetings that are supposed to be open will be open. Documents that are supposed to be disclosed will be disclosed, period. Thank you very much. Our last question is for Delegate Brave Boy, and it comes from uh, Ms. Wilkins. And this question is on public safety. Some county state's attorneys have found the repeal of Maryland's death penalty to leave them at a disadvantage. The changed language in the statute has presented an unintended outcome that allows defense attorneys to motion for the jury to sentence defendants instead of the judge. This is troublesome since there are no instructions for how a jury should do that. In Prince George's County, the state's attorney's office fought and won a recent motion ensuring that a judge would sentence a defendant who was convicted of a quadruple murder. Given the opportunity, what would your opinion, if any, be on shoring up the state's repeal of the death penalty as this issue might make its way to Annapolis next session? Well, I, I do agree. I mean, when we repealed the death penalty as, as a legislature, and I think all of us supported the repeal of the death penalty, um, it, we did so for a, for a few different reasons. I mean, obviously there were great disparities in treatment of defendants. And in addition to that, the people of the state of Maryland had been polled numerously, uh, numerous times on this issue, and the people of the state wanted us to repeal the death penalty, and we did. But we understood, we understand that when we create legislation or we pass new laws, sometimes they have unintended consequences and sometimes we need to revisit um, the laws so that we can, as you said, shore up and, and ensure that every defendant is being treated fairly in our criminal justice system because our system only works if it is fair to both the public and to the defendant. And so we have to work with our, uh, our prosecutor's office because we want to make sure that they have every tool that they need to put the bad guys and girls away. We don't want criminals on our streets, but we also don't want uh, civil rights lawsuits. We don't want constitutional lawsuits coming to, to the, uh, the state because we, did not, we weren't clear and we didn't give a definitive um, instruction to the uh, state's attorneys who are prosecuting the cases. So as Attorney General, I will work with the local state's attorney's offices, also the public defender's office and other civil rights groups to come up with instructions to both the court and to the state's attorney's office so that we will have a fair uh, a way of handling uh, the, sentencing, um, the, the, the sentencing instructions that go to Thank the jury. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Cardin, and I'm doing it right this time. Thank you very much, uh, and, a, and a good question. Um, we need to create predictability and stability in the system. And if there is an issue of fairness or inequality or non-predictability in how the system is working because different jurisdictions are doing it differently, then that is something that we can take up with the legislative office, as the, question was, the, the initial question was presented, um, in terms of changing legislation, or working with the counties and, and the way that they are defining rules to make sure that people are treated fairly. The fact of the matter is, is that 
fighting violent crime needs to be the number one priority of the, um, of the Attorney General's office. Figuring out how to focus on violent crime and on gangs and bringing uh, resources together has got to be the number one priority. And if we're not handling this with adequate civil rights, I will go to every single attorney, uh, state's attorney, all 24 jurisdictions, and tell them if they bring me a, a case that is tainted or polluted by racial profiling, we will not take the case on appeal. And I will tell all of my local state's attorneys, my local police, and my state police, and the federal authorities, all of them, that we need to cooperate and work together to make sure that everybody's treated fairly and that we have a safe place for people to live. And what that means is that there's got to be a guy there who can bring all these people together and can work. The National Association of Attorneys General has made this the number one priority for attorneys general in terms of public safety. It's bringing together these disparate groups and making sure that they're all working together for not only safety, but for fairness. Thank you very much. Well, let me say, I was one of the leaders in the fight to repeal the death penalty. Uh, we still have four people on death row. Uh, I hope and believe that their sentences will be commuted. I'm not a supporter of the death penalty, period. It, there is no room for mistake when the state exacts the ultimate uh, punishment. Uh, I have also been uh, tough on crime throughout my term in the General Assembly. I have led the fight to make Maryland safe for families. As I said before, I was the chief architect of the toughest gun safety measure in the United States of America. Uh, I have championed laws that protect victims of domestic violence, that uh, prosecute and prevent child abuse, child abusers, uh, that, uh, and I have sponsored legislation that gives courts greater opportunities to supervise uh, sexual predators. It's important that the Attorney General maintain uh, a, a tough stand on crime, but I will be tough on crime as well as smart on crime. Uh, we do have a problem with uh, over-incarceration, with mass incarceration. I've led efforts in the State Senate to reduce arrests for uh, folks who commit nonviolent offenses and to decriminalize marijuana. And in combination, I think those two uh, profiles make what we need for an attorney general. Thank you Thank very you. much. I do have a what is I do have a follow-up question because for this specific law, um, what appears to have happened is that either the attorney general's office did not see this loophole, or somehow it was missed that now we have state's attorneys who have to um, figure this out for themselves and make motions to try and fix what is a gap in the law. Um, so then my question would be, what is your specific take on that and something so important as uh, crimes that were once capital punishment um, falling through these kinds of loopholes? Well, the attorney general handles all criminal appeals. So any issue in any circuit court in any county in the state, if, if it's faced with this problem, ultimately makes its way to the office of the Attorney General because there are constitutional issues at stake, whether it goes, unless the defendant is acquitted, the Attorney General is going to have to deal with that problem. Uh, and it may be that the, that the law or the Constitution uh, needs to be amended. If that's the case as Attorney General, I would advocate for that. I don't think juries ought to be in the business of sentencing people to death. We've abolished the death penalty. And uh, as Attorney General, I would advocate to close a loophole if there is one. The courts of appeal have not, have not, uh, have not validated that assessment of the circuit court judge in Prince George's County. So as Attorney General, I'd be willing to take it on. If I lose it in court, I'll fix it in the General Assembly. Well, that completes our round of two rounds of questions. And now we come to closing statements, 90 seconds each. Um, again, based on the, uh, uh, the draw, it starts with Mr. Frosch and goes down to the right. Well, thank you all for being here this evening. The decision you have to make is who has the experience, skill, and above all, 
the judgment to be Maryland's chief legal officer, the person who gives wise counsel to our state agencies and to the people of the state of Maryland. Uh, I can promise you that I will show up every day and I will work hard for you. Uh, as Attorney General, I will continue to make Maryland safer. That's why police, correction officers, state's attorneys, and sheriffs across the state have endorsed me. I am committed to giving every child in our state a quality education and a safe place to learn. That's why the teachers have endorsed me. I will stand up for consumers and fight for working families of the state of Maryland. That's why the AFL-CIO, the SEIU, and Progressive Maryland have endorsed me. Uh, I will fight to make sure that our bay is protected and so are our natural resources. That's why the League of Conservation Voters and the Maryland Sierra Club have endorsed me. And the two people who know best what it takes to be Attorney General, former Attorneys General Steve Sachs and Joe Curran have endorsed me because they know I'll be the people's lawyer. The Washington Post has endorsed me as well, calling it a slam dunk. I, I'm very proud to have earned all of their support. I hope to earn your support as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Carver, Mr. Carver, please, please. Thank you again for this opportunity. I would like to end with a story. It's a story about a young girl named Grace, a 15-year-old Howard County promising student, but Grace was being bullied. It wasn't the kind of bullying that you may remember from the schoolyard. She was being bullied over the internet every day for months and months. She was getting emails, threats of sexual assault and rape. She couldn't handle it anymore. So she finally closed down, her, closed down her computer because every time she read an email, she felt like she was getting punched in the gut. And then she would go home, she stopped going to school, and her friends would call her at night and say, this is what he wrote about you on Twitter, on Facebook, what he's going to do to you if you came to school the next day. Tragically, Grace took her own life two years ago, Easter Sunday. But here's what I did about it. With the help of Grace's mom, I, pa I drafted and we passed the toughest anti-cyberbullying legislation in the country. We are now a national leader in protecting our kids on the Internet. I'm proud of that. The fact of the matter is, is that without, without the help of Grace's mom and the work of the legislature, we never would have done this. I've learned from this tragic event that our young people are dealing with pressures and issues that we never dreamed of 30 years ago. Once those issues are on the internet, it can affect their lives forever. Their emotional status, their job prospects, the security clearance. And well, what I learned is that my daughter, who's, who's two years old, she's already playing music before she even learned to walk. She was already playing music on my wife's iPhone. And she was uh, having a conversation with her parents, over, with her grandparents over Skype in Boston. This is, these are the next generation issues that the next Attorney General is going to have to deal with. And the fact of the matter is, is that the much. Attorney General needs to protect our children. It's one of the most important things. And as Attorney General, I'm excited about doing that for you and your families. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us all here this evening. And I want to let you know that protecting wealth and economic opportunity will be my top priorities as your next Attorney General. For most Maryland families, their wealth is found within their jobs and within their homes. And with respect to jobs, in 2012, Maryland collected uh, about $3.7 million in unpaid wages, in wages uh, and money that was supposed to be paid to Maryland families that, that wasn't. Wage theft remains a huge issue in Maryland. And in addition to that, in Maryland, women make 85 cents on the dollar. We cannot continue to allow our state to treat men and women differently when doing the same job. This is an issue for our generation. You know, I talked a lot about my representation of families facing foreclosure, but what's also happening is that the banks who were bailed out are now presenting another economic injustice to our state by not maintaining the bank-owned property. So when they foreclose on your properties, they're not you know, mowing the lawns, they're not fixing the broken windows, they're not uh, fixing the leaky roofs, and when they're selling these homes, they're selling them to investors that are paying far less than owner-occupiers. And what does that do to you and me? 
that brings down the value of our home. That artificially strips the wealth out of our homes. And so when you're paying your mortgage on time and you think you can borrow against the equity in your home to send your children to school, you can't. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. Well, do the clapping now. It's all right now. On behalf of the Brody Family Forum, uh, the School of Public Policy, and the University of Maryland, let me thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, let me thank the uh, candidates uh, for staying within the time frames, but also giving us very good answers. But let me particularly thank the journalists for asking the questions that you had to answer. And because everyone was so good, um, I, I'm told that there are sweets and something to drink outside. Thank you very much. <laughs>